Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for your kind introduction. I'm uh, thrilled to be back part of this program. It's uh, been 15 years or so, and it's been uh, great fun. Now let me see if I can work some of these machines here. Let's see, what do I want to do? I want to, good. There we go. Good. All right. So what I'd like to do today is tell you about liquid crystals. And in particular, what I'd like to do is show you that by understanding a little bit about what liquid crystals are, what they're made from, and why they behave as they do, one can have the underpinnings of an enormous industry that you uh, take advantage of and spend your money on and has really had a transformational impact on the world around us. So I'll talk today about liquid, the liquid crystalline state of matter from the laboratory to the shopping mall and one of my hidden themes is the idea that in fact there isn't such a wide gap between the laboratory and the shopping mall and many of the things that have a wonderfully positive impact on your daily lives not just pharmaceuticals but all sorts of materials and structures and computers and so forth have in their hearts physical and chemical phenomena that are really uh, right at uh, the frontier of what goes on in laboratories today worldwide. So what I hope you'll see today then is that applications of liquid crystals are all around us and I'll show you lots of examples and they're becoming more and more important in the world around us. As I said, what I'd like to do is expose you to the idea that if you know what they are, you can understand how and why they're so useful. And if you're lucky, with the next version of liquid crystals, sorry you're too late for this version, but with the next version, maybe you'll be the Bill Gates of a new uh, industry. So here's the plan of action. What I'd like to do, as I said, is show you why they're so useful. We'll look at some applications. Then we'll look at what liquid crystals actually are. Then what we'll do is we'll try and get to grips with some of the properties that make them so different from the many things that you're familiar with. Gases, liquids, and solids. What is it that's different about them and why do those differences have such a great uh, use? Then we'll talk a little bit about the science that goes into the basic elements of any sort of liquid crystal device. Basically the idea of how to mutate or transform the structure of liquid crystals using uh, little batteries and how to see the changes using light. So we're going to try to understand how to hang on to liquid crystals, how to mutate them with electric fields and what impacts those mutations have for uh, what you see with your eye. And there are many wonderful resources out there but I have to say I particularly like this book by Peter Collings from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. He's a terrific liquid crystal scientist, but he also took the trouble to write a truly gorgeous book, and much of what I'll talk about today can be found in one form or another in Peter's book, which is, I think, very appropriately called Liquid Crystals, Nature's Delicate Phase of Matter. Now, if you scour the web, you'll also find many uh, wonderful resources to do with liquid crystals. The Oxford Liquid Crystal Technology Group has a website that I'll tell you at the end. And also, a very important research outfit in the United States, the Kent State University Liquid Crystal Institute, has a marvelous website with all sorts of wonderful uh, information uh, on it. So I encourage you to look at these various sources, and I acknowledge them as material that I'm going to use in today's lecture. Now, Kevin already told you about this BCS at 50 conference. BCS stands for Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer. Bardeen was a marvelous professor of condensed matter theory here at the University of Illinois, and it's through his greatness that we have a strong department to this day. And the conference will celebrate one of the great cornerstones of modern thinking, not just condensed matter physics, not just physics, not just science, but really I think one of the high watermarks of human thought, how it was that people managed to wrestle with and beat the idea of superconductivity so that we could understand it. And as it happens, many of the phenomena that occur in superconductivity also occur in liquid crystals. And over the years, there's been a wonderful, fertile interplay of thinking between these two apparently disparate strands of science. In fact, going along with this conference, as Kevin said, 
is a lecture from Steven Weinberg, one of the most famous physicists alive today. And he's going to talk about lessons, lessons for high energy physics, the physics that describes the shorter structures in the universe, lessons in that subject that come from superconductivity. And as I said, liquid crystals have an intimate relationship with superconductivity, but so does high energy physics. And in fact, some of the great progress in the mid to late 19, uh, 20th century in high energy physics came from people who understood superconductivity and used some of its ideas to transform high energy physics. And Weinberg and um, Abdus Salam and Sheldon Glashow will go down in history as people who took two completely different uh, aspects of the physical world and managed to recognize, and this is something that all physicists dream of doing, managed to recognize that actually these phenomena, the so-called weak interactions, which are responsible for protons turning into electrons and neutrinos, uh, were uh, the same as electricity and magnetism in a certain sense that physicists can make clear. So this is a remarkable accomplishment and we're very lucky to have Weinberg visit us to tell us about superconductivity. Well, once upon a time, I would have to motivate this talk by telling you where liquid crystals might arise in technology. I might have to come up with examples like uh, the ability to make a glass screen opaque at the flick of a switch, a kind of electric version of curtains that could be pretty uh, useful. Or I might describe the fact that one can make visors for motorcycle helmets that can be turned at the flick of a switch or through the action of sunlight from something that is uh, more or less transparent to something that's rather more opaque to keep the glare out. I might, for example, show you uh, this uh, high fashion uh, situation where this dress is decorated with a kind of liquid crystal material that happens to be sensitive to light and changes how it reflects light according to the light around it. So you get a kind of ever-changing mood dress, so to speak. Or a kind of thermometer that you can use on your child's forehead, a rather non-invasive way of measuring temperatures, or you can keep track of the temperatures of wine, you can keep track, as we do at home, of the tem temperature of our gecko's cage, all using a kind of liquid crystal. Or I might show you what then was a prototype, the idea that your dashboard in your car might actually be written, the information might be written, using liquid crystal dis displays. Of course, these are routine things now, nowadays. So I don't have to show you prototypes anymore. I can show you the real thing. You all know about liquid crystal displays. Many of you use them. In fact, probably all of you use them. I could tell you about laptop computers, and you would appreciate the slimness, the slenderness of this screen here, and imagine uh, instead having to cart a bulky cathode ray tube onto your next uh, flight when you need to catch up with some work on the airplane. You might, for example, like fishing and you need some kind of navigation device with this beautiful clear screen, or one of my favorites and something that I need because I'm directionally challenged, a, uh, a Nuvi to help you navigate around Champaign-Urbana, for example, or a handheld PDA, or a, uh, an iPod, or an iPhone. All of these take advantage of liquid crystal technologies. So I don't really need to motivate this subject anymore. You know all about it. But as it happens, research on liquid crystals carries on to this very day. We're not done. There are all sorts of behaviors and properties of liquid crystals that we still need to figure out. New materials are invented daily and the way they organize themselves and swirl and flow need to be understood. And uh, in fact, in this very month's physics today, which is not like psychology today. This really is the trade journal of uh, physics and it's published by the American Physical Society. It's a very uh, important and high caliber magazine that we all read. The cover story happens to be precisely on the wonderful world of liquid crystals and there's a beautiful article there written by Peter Palfi from Kent State University in Ohio. And I won't touch upon this very much, but in fact some of the most popular parts of liquid crystal research today don't concentrate on molecules that I'll talk much more about later on that look more or less like a baseball bat, but nowadays people are interested in what are aptly called banana molecules and how they organize and what properties they have. So let's turn to practical liquid crystal display devices 
and think about what goes into them, take it apart, and see if we can figure out some of the science associated with liquid crystal devices. So in the old days, you might have a pocket calculator, and that pocket calculator might, might be able to read out half a dozen numbers, and each of those numbers would require the ability to make black or silvery a little element of the screen. If we want to do more than just read out numbers, we need more than just seven elements. We need perhaps 35 to be able to crudely write various characters. But either way, the ability to transform this little element in a way that consumes hardly any power and is very heavily reproducible and doesn't falter if we happen to uh, uh, put our uh, pocket calculator or computer down a bit more bumpily than we meant to, uh, if we can understand this kind of process, how we can transform these little elements of a picture, these picture elements, then we're in business and we can understand how to move on and build more exotic things like large TV screens and so forth. But the basic idea is to understand one of these elements and how to control it. And to understand that, what we're going to do is take it apart and have a look inside and try and understand some of the fundamental science associated with these objects. And in so doing, we'll figure out the basic uh, ingredients of pocket calculators and certain types of watches and car displays and all the examples that we've looked at so far. So don't be scared of this transparency. We're going to look at it and take the pieces apart and then later on we'll come back to it having understood the various ingredients. So a typical picture element of a liquid crystal display looks something like this. There's you looking downwards and although you don't know it, what you're looking at is an object that lets light through, but only light of a certain brand or polarization, and we'll come back to this concept of polarization shortly. The light then goes through something that's also a little bit unfamiliar. This is an electrode. You certainly have the idea of taking a battery and two leads and applying them to some sample and perhaps measuring a current or seeing how bright a light bulb becomes. But here, the electrodes are somewhat unusual because although they need to supply a voltage across this cavity, they also need to be see-through. So there are transparent electrodes. Then there are two bits of plastic or wood or whatever you need to hold this cavity open. And then sitting inside in, in what look like Vs, but are supposed to, you're supposed to think of this interior as having molecules that at the top are pointing this way, but by the time they get to the bottom are pointing this way. And we'll come back to all this in detail as we go along. This is the really important guts of the object. This is the liquid crystalline medium, and the twist in it and the behavior of light as it passes through this twisted medium is right at the heart of why liquid crystalline materials are so useful for displays. So what happens then is the light comes through, and in, when we haven't got the device turned on, well, what does your liquid crystal display look like? kind of looks silvery. And the reason it looks silvery is that, in effect, you're looking through this structure and you're seeing a mirror at the bottom. When you turn the device on and you want to write the character zero, then some of these little elements have to be turned black. And as we shall see later on, what happens is the organization, this beautiful uniform pattern of the liquid crystals here gets changed. And when it gets changed, the light can't get in and out, so what you see is black. So what we need to do is understand what there is inside, why, when you apply a small voltage to it, something interesting happens, and why that reorganization, that interesting reorganization, influences the way that light goes through. Uh, if we can get to grips with that topic, we'll understand how this entire billion dollar a year industry is uh, founded. So that's our task. So we want to get to grips with liquid crystals and figure out what they are. And one useful way that scientists approach figuring out what something is, is to first of all think about what it's not. So what liquid crystals are not are ordinary states of matter. And you know lots of ordinary states of matter by now. For example, you know the ice that sits in your uh, refrigerator. And you know that when uh, fluids, for example, are cold, then what happens is uh, they become rigid. They're things that when you try and change their shape, they fight back and don't let you. And the reason for that is that the atoms or molecules inside, when the system is cold, like to sit in a very, very regular array. 
about which they, the atoms or molecules just jitter or quiver a bit. So here's an example. It's a, it's, it, it's a useful way to think. It's not quite what's inside a piece of um, uh, salt, for example. But what you have here is a crystalline lattice where the reds are supposed to be sodium ions, uh, sodium's stripped of an electron, and the whites are supposed to be chlorine that have gathered up those electrons. And the pair of entities sit in this beautiful regular array, and the regular array knows about geometry. It can see that there's a structure, and it fights back if I try to change the shape. Now, if we warm that substance up, what happens is more and more and more jiggling takes place. And eventually, the jiggling beats out the forces that are holding the structure together, and you all know what happens. The solid melts and becomes a liquid. So in a liquid, the, the objects still want to be near one another. They still hang around. We say they've condensed into a kind of self-sustaining blob, just like the water droplets that collect on your windshield in, the car, in your car. So you might need a lid on to keep them, excuse me, you don't even need a lid on to keep the objects in place. So as you warm up, and we'll see lots of pictures like this, you go from colder, where there's beautiful organization, to warmer, where things hang together, but everything is moving around, not just jiggling, but wandering throughout the whole container. And if we heat up more, then even this tendency to hang together is lost, and one needs a lid to keep the stuff in place, and that's what we call a gas. Now, you can ask, why does this happen? And in fact, there's a very general principle running throughout all of physics that says the warmer you make things, the more they care about all the possible different ways they have to be. And a liquid has many, many, many ways to be compared with a crystal that has almost no ways to be. And as you warm up, the number of ways to be, we have a technical name for it, we call it entropy, begins to dominate more and more and more. And energy, the property that said, let's stick around near one another in a beautiful regular crystal structure, becomes less and less relevant. So the warmer you are, the number of ways to be dominates more and more, and eventually the crystal is destroyed. And if we heat up even more, we don't just lose the positional order of the organization of the atoms in the crystal, but we lose even more. We don't even hang together and we have a gas. So the next comes a very important concept. What state of matter you have is a reflection of how organized the material is. Cold, very organized. Hot, very di di disorganized. And warming causes a progression between the two between the three, in fact. And these points at which these uh, extreme changes take place are very important points that uh, physicists and chemists and material scientists spend a huge amount of time exploring and trying to understand. So our classification of the traditional forms of matter, gas, hot, liquid in the middle, and solid or crystal, cold, is fine. And it works very well for lots of stuff. And in fact, it works so well that you didn't really need to think very much about it before today. But it turns out that it's really only an adequate description if the um, molecules that are forming the crystal look more or less spherical, more or less round like this. So this, as you know, is a soccer ball. I call it a football, but that will confuse us because we need to contrast this object with what you would call a football. And what's the difference? Well, well, what differences do you see? It's not that difficult. The questions get harder, so answer now, and then you won't get picked on later. This one's round, and this one isn't, right? We have a technical name for that. We say that this is isotropic. All directions are the same, apart from the advertising on it. If I rotate it, you can barely see any changes whereas this one really knows what direction it's pointing in. We call this one anisotropic, or not the same in every orientation. And it turns out that when you make um, material out of molecules that look more like this than like this, then where they are counts, 
in terms of how organized the state of matter is, but which way they're pointing also counts. Which way this is pointing is not terribly important. Which way this is pointing is really important. And so what we find is that we have a whole slew of new avenues of, of ways for matter to be organized, taking into account not just where the stuff is, which tells me that I have this regular crystal lattice compared with this random jumble of ever-evolving uh, lack of patterns. And now that we have orientation or which way we're pointing, we also have new options. And let's see what some of those new options are. So we've seen what are not liquid crystals. We've seen that when we make stuff out of water, for example, or other roughly spherical molecules, carbon, tetrachloride, methane, and so forth, we get gases, liquids, and solids. But if we make matter out of a different molecule, this one just happens to be called piezoxyanisole. The important point about it is it looks much more like a baseball bat than a basketball. When we make matter out of this kind of molecule that's got some nice rigid carbon rings and some nitrogen in the middle and some hydrogen decorating all the way around, the details don't really matter. For our purposes, it's basically a cigar or a baseball bat. When we make matter out of these, then where they point has a huge impact. And we know that. When I was 11, I received for my birthday the Guinness Book of Records, and it had a picture that caught my attention then. And obviously marked my destiny as a liquid crystal researcher. So I presume that this person is no longer with us, but I'm not sure, and I'm always worried that he might be in the audience. But his name is Simon Argovich, and there was a time where, and presumably he had good reasons for this, he mastered the art of smoking simultaneously 12 full-size cigars. Now, you may not appreciate the following fact about this picture, but in order to cram these cigars in, what he had to do was align them quite considerably. Not because one end was burning, that of course is important, but not for our purposes, but because just as with trying to get chalk in a box, you have much better chance if you align the chalk than if you just let it be scrambled, pointing in all directions. And this fact that when you condense or bring matter together that is pointable, that it tends to align and, in fact, is more easily compressed if, it's, if the pointing is all done in the same direction, lies at the very heart of why liquid crystal states of matter form. So we've seen what liquid crystals are not. Now let's see what they are. Liquid crystals are states of matter that have no or just a little bit of what we call positional order. Positional order says, am I likely to have an atom here but not here? Am I likely to have an atom here, but not here? Just like in a crystal where we saw pref preferred places for stuff to sit. So liquid crystals have very little or none of that kind of organization. But what they do have is organization associated with the orientations, the directions in space that the molecules are pointing. And that property rules out ordinary liquids. And as I've said a number of times, they're typically liquid crystalline states of matter are typically exhibited when the molecules involved look like cigars or nowadays look like dinner plates. One can make molecules that look like dinner plates and they tend to stack rather like dinner plates too. Now you can let your imagination roam here and it turns out, and we'll see a few of them, that there's a huge zoo of possible ways for matter to organize once we allow for its orientation to play a role. By the way, this is just an aside, but this is a wonderful molecule here, or a model of a wonderful molecule. Has anybody seen this before? Anybody know its name? Not that its name matters. It's a buckyball, bucky yeah. It's, a, it's a, an, a molecule that has 60 carbon atoms and nothing else in it, and it's wonderfully stable and a very interesting structure that has stimulated a huge amount of a science. One can pop metal atoms inside, for example, and make superconductors and do all sorts of other really quite fascinating things with them. This, uh, this molecule won the Nobel Prize for uh, Croto, Curly, and Small a few years ago. Um, all right, so we're beginning to think about what liquid crystals are and what they are not. So let's look at an example. So here's the, the simplest example of a liquid crystal state of matter. So let me remind you. 
we're going to talk about a state called the pneumatic state. And we, we don't need to understand much more than the pneumatic state for our purposes. I should say pneumatic state from the Greek nema, which means thread. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later on about why these are called pneumatics and why they have the word nema, which is the same word as in nematode or worms. Why are they, why are they named after worms? We'll see later. Well, you may remember that we've already seen for ordinary matter that if we're cold, we're solid, and if we're hot, we're a gas, and as we increase the temperature, we pass through a regime of being a liquid. Liquid crystals inhabit a new space that, or window that can open up between the solid and the ordinary liquid. So what happens is if you heat rod-like molecules like this piezoxyanisole that look like a baseball bat, what happens is this. You warm up the crystal. The crystal has all the molecules sitting at special places and pointing in a special direction. As you warm them up past 118 degrees centigrade, where they sit gets forgotten, but how they point doesn't. And so this is a snapshot here. Each of these little blue lines is supposed to be the instantaneous position of where one of these molecules are. If I look at any one of them, it'll wander around. Its position will swim all the way past all the others. And its orientation will rock a little bit back and forth, but it will point more or less in the same direction. So we've still got some organization in this intermediate phase. The direction that the molecules are pointing is remembered, but where, they're si where they sit is not. And the way physicists think about it is, this is we imagine drawing a little box, a tiny little box, and we just have a look inside and we wait for a long time, at least in our minds. And we ask the question, do the molecules that, always, that come in and flow out and come in and flow out typically point in the same direction? And if we do, and if that, if that phenomenon persists essentially forever, then we say that the system is orientationally ordered. We can also ask the question, if I move the box to another place, will I be more or less likely to find stuff in it? And there again, we'll find that in this liquid, and with all liquids, we have no preference for finding matter anywhere, in contrast with the crystal, where we have preferred places to find stuff. But the stuff that comes in and goes out of our little imaginary box will typically point in more or less the same direction. So we have no positional order, like a liquid, but we do have preferred orientations, a little bit like a crystal, and we call this an anisotropic liquid. It's a liquid that has a special direction associated with it, which is quite a strange thing. Now, it turns out that these liquids are kind of rubbery when you do some things to them, or they flow like milk when you do other things to them. So let's imagine we took six pieces of liquid crystal, of pneumatic liquid crystal, and we organized the molecules to lie roughly east-west here, or roughly north-south here and here, and roughly east-west here. And it turns out there are five different things we can do when we try and deform, as we would say with a, an eraser, when we try and deform this sample. And for three of these things that we could do, they happen to go by the names of splay, twist, and bend, that doesn't really matter, when we make these deformations, the system fight back, fights back essentially forever, just as an eraser does when you bend an eraser. It doesn't matter how long you wait, it's still exerting a force that wants to straighten it out. On the other hand, when we make these kinds of deformations for a piece of liquid crystal, the molecules are able to flow one past one another and relax, and so just as when you move your hand through a bathtub, you feel a restoring force to begin with, but if you move your hand and then stop and wait, very quickly you don't feel your hand being pushed in any one direction or another. The same is true here. If you make these twist or bend deformations in these directions, the molecules just flow as if they were a fluid. So this is where liquid crystals get their name. For some things you do to them, they react like a crystal does, and for other things you do to them, they react like a liquid does. And so the name liquid crystal seems like a really good uh, idea. Now, there are lots more intricate examples, and I won't go through the whole zoo. There are dozens and dozens of possibilities, but I'll just mention a couple. Let me show you a few more states of matter here. Or, excuse me, a few more examples of a solid. So the black is supposed to be suggestive here. It's telling you that the atom is carbon. 
And if I move this around, you might be able to tell that the atoms are organized somewhat differently from the way the atoms in the sodium chloride crystal were. And does anybody see any kind of special feature that these atoms have? in their organization. So I don't know if you can see from there, but the atoms seem to be organized in sheets. And they are, actually. The sheets have this beautiful hexagonal structure. And we call individual sheets graphene, and that's one of the hottest topics in condensed matter physics nowadays. But the sheets are stacked on top of one another, and in fact, they can slide reasonably well past one another. And if this is actually uh, graphite. And you know that lead pencils have graphite inside, and it feels a little bit oily. And the reason it's oily is that these sheets slide past one another, or when you write on a page, some sheets slide off and get left on the page, and that's why you use that material for a lead pencil. Now, it turns out that liquid crystals can also organize themselves into sheets. And when they do, we have a new breed. Not the nematics that we talked about, but one's called smectics. And they're called smectic because this is the Greek for soap. And in fact, these materials also have a kind of slitheriness to them, just like graphite. And the reason is the following. Well, let's take this boringly named 10 bar S5 molecule. It doesn't really matter what its name is, but it looks like a baseball bat. And if we cool this down cold, we have a crystal. If we warm the crystal up, it melts, and it melts into a very strange structure where we have the molecules organized but tilted like this. They're all moving around, zipping back and forth in the plane. They're remembering which way to point, but they're not remembering anything about any positional or organization in this direction. But if we go into this little cavity here, what we find is that we're very unlikely to find many molecules there. And then there's a higher likelihood here, and then less, and then high and low. And so we have a kind of partial order. We have a little bit of crystallinity left in this direction where we have a kind of ripple in the density, but we have no organization in this direction and we have a tilt. So this is called smectic C. It doesn't really matter what its name is. But as we warm smectic C up, the molecules at some stage say, actually, we'd rather stand upright. So they stand upright, but they stay layered. And then we warm this one up a little bit more, and the layers melt, and we're left just with a pneumatic. We have orientational order, but no density waves anymore in this direction. And we heat up even more, and we have an ordinary liquid where even the orientation is forgotten. So you can see that there's quite a lot of possibilities, and they're quite intricate, but we won't, thankfully, need to delve into the properties of these liquid crystals. There's just one more that I want to mention, and it goes by the name of chiral pneumatic. Physicists use the word chiral when we want to discriminate between a left-handed something and a right-handed something. So for those of you who are cyclists, you may have struggled to take a pedal off a bicycle, and then you realize that the thread of the left-hand pedal goes the opposite way from normal threads, and the thread of the right-hand pedal goes the way you expect. So there are different possibilities for threads of screws, and there are molecules in nature, and especially in biology, that have a kind of handedness to them. If you take a mirror image of one, you can't lay it down on the other in just the same way that if you take two mates of a pair of gloves, no matter how hard you try, lots about them is exactly the same, but you can't lay one on top of the other. There's a difference between left and right-handed. And so too it can be with molecules. And molecules that have a handedness do something rather nice if they're long, and if they tend to align up. So in this region of space, the molecules have tended to point north-south, but what happens is, because of the handedness that each individual molecule has, as you move through space, the direction that the molecules like to point in evolves in space and rotates like this, like a propeller. And those objects were first found in derivatives from cholesterol, and so physicists often call them cholesteric molecules. And they have an important feature to them, which is the direction, that the direction of the pointing of the molecules drifts or wanders as you move through space in this kind of corkscrew way. And that introduces an important length, the pitch of the twist, how far you have to go before the molecules are pointing in the same direction again. And this has a strong influence on the way these materials interact with light. And we make 
thermometers out of this kind of material because this length changes when you change the temperature and that change causes light of different colors to be absorbed and reflected so you can see the temperature changing. And just as we saw before, somewhere between a solid and a liquid, there can be a window of various possibilities. So that's the chiral pneumatic state and we won't talk very much about that one either. All right. So now we know what liquid crystals are. They're states of matter in which rod-like molecules choose a direction to point in. And we could ask ourselves, how do they choose what direction to point in? And um, the answer to that question could be the subject of an entire lecture. In fact, it's the subject of an entire lecture course here at the University of Illinois called Spontaneous Symmetry Breaking. Now, what I've got here is a little piece of wood, a long rod. I'm not sure you can see it terribly clearly. But I'm going to tell you that it's very symmetrical, by which I mean when I rotate it as I'm now doing, there's almost no change in its properties. I can feel some slight ridges and ripples, but it's almost perfectly symmetrical with regard to rotations about the vertical axis. Of course, if I make other rotations, it changes but not when I roll it about the vertical axis. Now, you also know that if you take a piece of wood like this and you press down on it, well, what happens? Hmm. If I just press a little bit, what happens? Almost. If I really just press a little bit, just a tiny bit, Almost. But first, before that happens, it just gets shorter. So when I just press a little bit, and of course I'm going to cheat because it's going to bow when I don't want it to, but if I just press a little bit, it'll just get a little bit shorter. And only if I, and only if I press hard enough, and this was first understood by the great Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler, if I press more than a certain amount, not only will it get shorter, but it'll bow which is what you all said, and that's the, that's the interesting thing. That's the, the sh getting shorter is boring. So, when I press, it bows. But then we have to ask ourselves, fine, it bows, but which way does it bow? Because it could have bowed that way. But if it's true that my pushing is completely indifferent to the direction, and if the rod is completely symmetrical, then it could have bowed in any direction. So why did it bow one way or why did it bow the other? Anybody have any ideas about why it would bow one way or bow another? Well, yes. Let's suppose I tried the best I possibly could to press completely symmetrically. So I didn't push it. I didn't favor any direction. Yes, so the rod itself might not be symmetrical, but when we make molecules out of liquid crystals, one of the marvelous things about atoms is we can't go in and shave a bit off here and shave a bit off here. They're either really the same or they're different, and we can make stuff that's really the same. So I'm glad that you don't have an answer because this is one of the deepest ideas in all of physics. The point is that it could go in any direction, but it wants to go in some direction so just some random buffeting, there just happened to be a little bit more air blowing in this direction or there just happened to be a slight bump on this side of the stick, biases it and helps it select which way to go. And actually this idea that systems, when treated in a completely fair, unbiased, symmetrical way, respond by picking out something biased is called, we call it spontaneous symmetry breaking and it lies at the heart of not only what we do as condensed matter physicists, but everything that Kevin does, and really two-thirds, roughly speaking, of all physics is about spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that's what our liquid crystals did, because nothing about what I told you told the liquid crystals to stand this way, or to stand this way, or to stand this way. They could have done anything, but some random fluctuation, some environmental noise picked something out, and once they picked something out, they all agreed and they all pointed in the same direction in a kind of cooperative, collaborative way. And it's that collaborativity, that willingness of liquid crystals to follow one another in a sheep-like way that makes them so useful. 
Because what we can do is we can actually grab hold of the orientations in various ways. We can make the molecules prefer to point north, south, east, or west using various means. And we're going to see some of them to control the way that liquid crystals point. So here is just a sketch of some examples. It turns out that you can just take a simple glass slide and brush it. And brushing doesn't seem like a very uh, rough thing to do, but if you go down to the level of atoms and molecules, brushing creates little grooves. And those little grooves end up being home to the liquid crystals and can lock them in. And so if you want to grab hold of the way that liquid crystal molecules point, you can just brush a glass plate and stick it against the liquid crystals and because they don't care which way to point and you're giving them a reason to care, they'll follow your instructions. And so you can, for example, trap the liquid crystals to point in the surface and that's very useful as we'll see. You can also do something else. You can trap them to point perpendicularly and you can also trap them, for example, to lie somewhere on a cone of their choice. So there's lots of ways you can treat the boundaries and there's an awful lot of chemistry involved in making surfaces that grab hold of liquid crystals in useful ways. So now at least we have a chance of telling the liquid crystals which way to point. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to see if we can change the way they point by applying rather fine electric fields. So here's our liquid crystal molecule. Of course this is not to scale. There are billions and billions of them between these two uh, centimeter space little metal plates for example. But when we do nothing to these little metal plates, the molecule doesn't care very much about them apart from this issue that we talked about earlier that it might grab hold near the surface. On the other hand, if we charge up the plates, if we put extra electrons down here and take some electrons away from up here, then we'll have what's called an electric field. And an electric field is something that pushes on positively charged particles and forces them one way and pulls negatively charged particles back the other way. So here's our little um, rod-like molecule, our baseball bat. It doesn't have more positive charge at one end than the other. It's supposed to be symmetrical. But if I pull on the negative electrons, they'll slurp a little bit up one end. And if I pull up, push on the positively charged nuclei, they'll move a little bit down the other end. And the whole object will be what we say slightly polarized. And it can take advantage of these charges up here and down here and line up. And so it turns out that we can control the way that molecules point by applying electric fields. And that's a very important tool that we're going to use. Now, why it is that molecules line up this way and not this way in an electric field is a deep issue of quantum mechanics, but it's not something we have time to talk about today. Now, why does this phenomenon matter for liquid crystals, but not really matter for gases and ordinary liquids and solids? Well, in, in uh, ordinary solids, the stuff is held pretty firmly in place by the other stuff. So when you apply an electric field, everything else is telling it to stay in place and it'll just very weakly respond. In a gas or a liquid, the stuff is all moving around so fast and so happily that when you try and tell it to point in a certain direction, you'll get a little bit of an effect, but not much. But this cooperativity or collaboration amongst liquid crystals says if you can get them to move in a certain direction, they're all going to follow like sheep. And so it turns out that these kind of applications of electric fields can make your molecules all point in the same direction. Seeing as they all want to point in the same direction anyway, all they have to do is select out which direction to point in. So liquid crystals are very exquisitely sensitive to electric fields. Now we just have one more story to tell after this one before we can wrap everything up. And this, the story, the uh, penultimate story is this one that says let's put together the idea of holding the liquid crystals at the boundary, this anchoring phenomenon, on the one hand, and on the other hand trying to get them to point in a certain direction using an electric field. And it turns out that these two processes compete with one another. The boundary wants to hold the molecules pointing east-west and the molecules that are pointing east-west tell their neighbors to point east-west and so on all the way through the medium and any deformation of that costs energy. On the other hand, the electric field is telling the molecules to point north-south. And what happens is as you turn up the electric field from nothing to small to large, the system, if you like, snaps at some stage. It undergoes what we call a Friedrichs transition which is very much 
like this Euler strut because it had to choose to flip this way or that way. <coughs> Excuse me. And this process allows us to use a small electric field or a modest electric field to reshape the pattern of molecular orientation here in the middle of the sample. And so we're going to use that in our liquid crystal device. So let's take stock of where we are. We've seen how to control the direction that liquid crystals point in, and we've seen that liquid crystals consist of molecules that like to point in the same direction. That's great. We can control what's going on. Now the question is, how can we see the implications of that control to make something that actually creates a TV screen or a laptop or one of our many applications? And to understand this aspect requires us to think about how light interacts with matter. Now, how light interacts with matter is a long and beautiful story that lies right at the heart of very much of physics. And I want to just give you a glimpse of that story. First of all, what is light? That also could be the subject of another lecture. In fact, it's the subject of an entire college, not just department at the University of Arizona. is such an important topic. So what is light? Light is this remarkable idea that if you take the vacuum, take this room and empty all the gas out of it, there's still stuff there, and that stuff is called the vacuum. And the vacuum isn't just nothing. We used to think that the vacuum was just nothing. But the vacuum is something. The vacuum is a little bit like an entire region filled with little swings. And those little swings can swing. And as they swing, they convert, when it, if it really were a swing, kinetic energy, the energy of motion down near the bottom where the swing is moving fast, to potential energy when the swing is high. So when a swing swings, what happens? We've got lots of potential energy. Now it's given up. And now we have lots of kinetic energy. That's given up, now we have lots of potential energy, and we have a swinging back and forth. And the vacuum is really like that, and it's filled with lots of different types of swings. Some of them make quarks, some of them make electrons, some of them make muons. Many different types of swings, but the swing we're going to talk about today is the swing that makes electricity and magnetism. So imagine you had this forest of swings, and you pushed one of them, and let's imagine they were joined onto one another. Then, then that swinginess would ripple out through the rest of the swings. And that's exactly what happens when light passes, well, I shouldn't say passes through a vacuum, because light is a replacement of the vacuum by a kind of excitation. And we've kind of excited the vacuum up into something new. So light is this remarkable self-sustaining ripple where electric fields in some point of space that are changing in time cause magnetic fields. And as those magnetic fields change in time, they cause electric fields. And as those electric fields change in time, they cause magnetic fields. And the two just bootstrap one another back and forth and create this wave that propagates through our space and time. So if we could take a snapshot of light, what we would see is a pattern in space that says that there's a strong electric field pointing up here. But as I move this way, the field gets smaller and smaller, and then it goes negative and points down, and then it points up, and then it points down, and so on and so forth. And that pointiness, the red direction to the electric field, is really just the answer to the question, what way would a little positively charged particle move if it happened to be sitting there? So if we had a little positive charge sitting here, it would be pushed down. And if it was sitting here, it would be pushed up. And this whole pattern slides this way at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. So this is one brand of light. We call it linearly polarized, because if I sit at this spot, and this pattern slides to the right, then what happens is the force I feel starts down and then up, and then down and then up as these lobes pass me. And so what I do is I feel a force up and down and up and down along a line. And we call that linearly polarized. There's another brand in which the light comes out this way and back and back, out and back and out and back of the screen. And that's another version of linearly polarized light. And we can actually add them together. We can add the upward light to the sideways light. And we can do them in phase so that they're happening at the same time. And if we add up the forces on the particles, they'll move along the diagonal. So we'll still have linearly polarized light. 
but we can also add this up and down field to this side to side field out of phase with one another. And if you add up the forces then, you'll find that they swirl around like this. So my particle would feel a force going out in different directions as time progresses. And that brand of light is called circularly polarized light. And I'm telling you this because we're going to need to think a little bit about light and polarization in the last 10 or 10, 15 minutes or so. 10 minutes, I hope. So that's light, and we should reflect on it. It's a pretty amazing thing, and maybe we just take it for granted. But there it is. So how does light interact with matter? Well, you kind of know, but you might not have thought about it, and maybe I can turn this on here and see. How does light interact with matter? I'm going to try and get this up on the screen. Maybe that will do. Let's see what happens. So, no, I don't want that. So what you can see here is a tank full of water that's just been colored with a little yellow dye. And we've got light coming up from this side, and it's being reflected down from the interface. And if I steepen the angle, you can see more and more. Ah, something happened. Now there's light emerging. We have a phenomenon, what's called total internal reflection, which limits what fish see when they look up through the surface. But let's not get into that because they probably don't care anyway. Okay, so this is light coming through an interface, and you can see that it gets bent. And it gets bent because the light actually moves at a different speed when it moves through air from, than when it moves through water. And you can see that kind of bending, or we call refraction. Why does it happen? Well, it happens for the following reason. Here comes my light wave into my, through my air meeting the water. And that light carries an electric field and that electric field rips and pulls on the atoms in the water. And those atoms in the water are then shaken and when charges are shaken they act like antennas and they radiate out more light. So all the molecules near the surface here act like little beacons of light but then an amazing thing happens. The light in all directions cancels one another out except for two special directions, a reflected beam and a refracted beam. And that's all you get, incoming, bent, and reflected. <coughs> and the reason that this is the only choice of what happens is that there's nothing special about the orientations of space as soon as you move a few atoms away, a few molecules away from the surface of the water. Now what happens if we replace this water now by something that is an anisotropic liquid, a liquid crystal. So now what do we have? We have air and we have liquid crystals and now you're supposed to think of the liquid crystal molecules all pointing more or less in and out of the page, moving around but still pointing more or less in and out of the page subject to a few little fluctuations here and there. Now let's think about the light coming in. Well the light coming in could be thought of as carrying, could have its electric field going in this direction and then it pulls and pushes on the molecules across the direction of the molecules or the electric field could be coming out of the screen and back in in which case the electric field is pulling and pushing along the molecular direction and you can imagine that the molecules are going to respond differently to light going across them and light coming alongside them and in fact they do and because of that one gets not just one refracted beam but two depending on the polarization of the incoming light and we can actually see that not here with a liquid crystal today but with a crystal that happens to have sufficiently low symmetry that we can I didn't want to do that uh, sufficiently low symmetry that we can actually see this effect so this is a calcite crystal it's very uh, very anisotropic inside and if we look at the word went there, maybe you can see two copies. I'm not sure yet. I guess you can see two copies of the word went. I promise you that there aren't two. There's two that emerge because the light coming up from the projector has all polarizations and the polarizations are getting filtered or separated. And if we kill one of them with a polarizer, then you just see one copy of went. And if we rotate the polarizer, you see the other copy. It's pretty amazing, huh? So you can see that the light got filtered according to its polarization. We're going to see lots more like that. If you don't mind, 
I would just use about another 10 minutes if you can tolerate that. If you have to go or want to go, by all means go. But there's enough little bits of the story left, and I've gone so slow that there's still a few things to, to happen. So that's um, the idea of double refra uh, refraction, or we call it birefringence, and that is going to be part of our story. If I can get my picture back. And I have. Good. All right. So, key idea, two types of refraction depending on polarization in the incoming beam. I probably should have told you this already, but let's just talk a little bit about polarizers. Light, as I told you, can come in two brands, up and down electric fields or side to side. I'm slightly lying because they can be mixtures of those things or superpositions of those things, but let's imagine those two things just for now. We can find types of plastic and other sorts of objects, just like the Polaroid in your sunglasses, that say to light that's coming in, I'm only going to let through the type where the electric field runs up and down. And if we rotate this object, we'll just let through the light coming in back and forth. And we'll call this idea of light, this brand of light vertical linear polarization and this one horizontal. And polarizers or analyzers do just this. They, are, they only let through one brand or another, and we're going to need a pair of them to build our liquid crystal display. So let's ask ourselves, what happens when we pass light of all polarizations through a polarizer so that we only get up-down electric fields of light coming through? And now, let's suppose we enter some liquid crystal, and then we send light through and then we have a polarizer in the opposite direction. So let me show you what happens if I don't put any liquid crystal in there. So if I put no liquid crystal in there, this is what happens. And there are some shocks. So here's a polarizer. You can see the electric field, allowed electric field, red arrows to tell me. So half the light gets through. And now I'm going to put another one on top. And almost all the light that got through still gets through. Now, what's going to happen when I turn it? Extinction. Pretty amazing. Extinction. Okay? Now, this should be a shock to you. If it's not, you're not thinking hard enough. We haven't got any light coming through. So how can I make some light come through? Can I? Well, one thing I can do is I can just turn this. Well, that's not very interesting. But I'm going to stick something else in the middle, and now light's going to come through again. How could that possibly be? If the light wasn't getting through and I'm just mutating something in the middle, I hope it's true. Is it really true? <laughs> yeah. So dark, light, dark. And I'm not cheating. You can come and do this. <laughs> it's pretty fantastic. I mean, you know, us physicists, we sort of take it for granted. But I have to say I'm kind of dazzled every time. Maybe that's not the right word. OK, so that's polarization. And I won't explain that part about the middle one right now, but we'll come back to it in a minute. So we want to ask ourselves, what happens if I can use this machine? Right. What happens if we stick nothing in the middle? So we haven't got any stuff in the middle here. And we've got a polarizer letting through up and down and an analyzer letting in and out. And nothing gets through. We just saw that. We really did the experiment. No light got through. Now we're going to ask, what happens if we pour in roughly, without being careful experimentalists, we just dump some liquid crystal in here? Will we see any light? And we're going to ask ourselves, what sort of pattern will we see? And this really will be one of the last building blocks for a liquid crystal device. So let's suppose we poured our liquid crystal in. And let's suppose that the molecules up here at 12 o'clock were pointing up and the molecules down here at 9 o'clock were pointing east-west and so forth in this kind of star-like pattern. Actually, the fact that this star-like pattern can exist or some variant of it is where liquid crystals get their name. I'm going to lie a little bit now for the sake of uh, clarity, but um, you can see that there's some kind of fault line running, a clock, uh, running along the axis of this tube of liquid crystals here because the direction varies very rapidly as I move away depending on the direction that I leave the center. So there's some kind of fault line. And it's fault lines like this, but not exactly like this one, 
that actually appear. When you dump liquid crystal into a beaker, there are threads or fault lines running through it, and that's where the name pneumatic comes from, pneumatic being the, word, the Greek word for thread. Now, we're going to send our light in through a uh, polarizer and we're going to see what comes out through the analyzer just as we've done a couple of times and the shocking thing is that we see these Maltese crosses we see no light north-south we see no light east-west but we see light in the four quadrants in fact I'll show you what really happens in an experiment what happens is this you get these gorgeous patterns and if you look closely you'll see lots of these fourfold uh, black white black white patterns not only that, but if you look across the sample, you'll see that actually, roughly speaking, they put all those little stars point in the same direction. Now, why is that? I'm running short of time, so I'm not going to tell you in great detail, but the basic idea is that the light that's coming through the 12 on the clock face comes in with the electric field up and down and sees only molecules up and down. So when it gets to the other end, it's still moving up and down and it meets an polarizer that extinguishes it so you see nothing the light coming through at nine o'clock is coming through up and down and just sees molecules this way nothing happens to it gets extinguished but the light that comes through at let's say 10:30 comes through and the light comes in like this but it sees molecules like this so the best way to think about that situation is to break this light up into two pieces one piece going this way, one piece going this way, and if I add them up, they make a lot up and a lot down, but the side to side cancel, leaving me with my up and down. And this one travels parallel to the hand of the clock, this one travels perpendicular, and they travel at different speeds and they get out of phase, and when they get out of phase, they have a little piece of them left that's running this way. And that piece that's running that way, that's not a laser pointer, this is, the piece that's running that way makes it through the analyzer and you see a bright spot. And that's the origin of these patterns here. That's why you see these lovely swirly patterns. One more example and then we'll put the whole story together. Instead of having our fault line liquid crystal, we're going to have a liquid crystal that has a twist to it. This is one of our cholesterics. The molecules are lined up but the, the direction of lining up twists as you go through the medium. That's called a cholesteric. We've seen it already. And now we're going to ask what happens to our light. Well, in comes the light, vertically up and down. And that light that's up and down is now best thought of as two brands. One swirling this way and one swirling this way. And when I add them up, the side to sides cancel, the up and downs add, and they leave me with lots of up and down, which is what I wanted. Now this way is moving with the swirl of the liquid crystal. This way is moving against the swirl of the liquid crystal and they'll move at slightly different speeds. So what used to be in phase will get out of phase and what will happen is the direction of polarization will move. And because that direction of polarization moves, some light will get through. And it turns out that the, um, the amount by which the, the, the plane of polarization is rotated depends on the color so one color gets selectively passed through. And so there was white light behind this cholesteric, and what came out the front was blue with some bed springs, which are remnants of fault lines running through the material. Now we can show you this. So what have I got here? Not champagne, but corn syrup. Corn syrup is a biological molecule, and it has a handedness to it. So what do you see? you just now see illuminated corn syrup. Turns out the light coming through is polarized, let's say up and down. Now what happens when I put this in front? Ah, I think you can see some color. Maybe I can rotate this so people can see. Does it look different? Yellow and now colored. And in fact the color varies throughout the glass a little bit. And what's happening here is that our incoming polarized light can be thought of as light like this. And one handedness of light reacts to the handed molecules in the corn syrup slightly differently from the other handedness of light. And the plane of polarization changes and the purple light happens to be just rotated enough to get through and other colors don't. 
And so that's a real example of how light interferes, I shouldn't say interferes, interacts with um, chiral media. Let me just show you a little bit more of this. Let me get rid of this for a second. Uh, there we go. Now, one polarizer, we used it before. One analyzer, we used it before. Nothing getting through, everything getting through that got through before. Hmm, what is this? Scotch tape on a glass sheet. Am I lying? You're my daughter, so you have to say no. <laughs> so. All right, now what's going to happen? We put it on there. Nothing much happens. It's still white, isn't it? Hmm. Now let's see. Why is that? Pretty cool. Wow. We could do something similar. Do you see any pattern on this? Not much. <laughs> Maybe you can see something on there. How about now? All oh, this is very similar to what we just talked about. Why did the scotch tape have such a huge impact on the light? Well, the reason is that what scotch tape is made out of long chain molecules called polymers. And when you process them to make the scotch tape, you pull on them and they tend to align. And so you have a medium that has a very strong alignment to it, and that alignment has a huge impact on the propagation of polarized light through it. Let's just do one more of these. I'm kind of fond of this one. Scrunched up chocolate box plastic. Nothing very exciting. But then it gets kind of exciting. There you go. So again, the stresses in this film of plastic have caused the molecules to align and they're influencing the way that light passes through it. Okay, time to wrap everything up, which I will do. So, I want to get back to my screen and we are done. Because, back to our liquid crystal device. Let's put together all the elements that we had. What did we have? Well, we had liquid crystal in here. And we're going to choose to use liquid crystal of the type that wants to align with itself, except we're going to put a little bit of handed liquid crystal that causes a little bit of swirl, just so that when we drop it and let the thing uh, reach equilibrium again, everything swirls in the same direction. We're going to anchor the liquid crystals at the top this way, and at the bottom we're going to anchor them in and out of the screen. So we're going to force a twist by 90 degrees, in these molecules. So that's what we've done. So we've got liquid crystal in there and it's twisted. We've got a polarizer here that only lets through polarized light going this way and we've got a polarizer down here that only lets through light with the electric field coming in and out of the board and we've got our two transparent electrodes. Now what happens? What happens is that light comes in at the top only the polarized this way light makes it through the polarizer and through the electrode. It goes down through here and just as with a cholesteric, if we choose the spacing and the material right, the axis of polarization will get rotated by 90 degrees and that light will make it through the, the guard or gatekeeper at the bottom, bounce off the mirror, back through the polarizer, back through the electrode, get unraveled, back through the electrode and back through the polarizer. And that's why your liquid crystal watch when the battery's flat looks silvery. Now how do we do something with it? All we do is we apply a tiny voltage to this pair of electrodes which pulls on the molecules inside. So this is what it did, our Friedrichs effect. The electrode caused the molecules in the interior to reorient themselves and now when the light comes through it mostly goes parallel to the molecules not perpendicular and so it doesn't have its polarization axis rotated so the light comes in linearly polarized goes through mostly linearly polarized and meets the gatekeeper this polarizer at the bottom doesn't get through so there's nothing left to be reflected and what you see is black, and that's how you draw the black characters on your pocket calculator. So you can turn from silver to black 
color, arrays, all that stuff, no big deal. The hard part was understanding this one particular element, one pixel, and that's what we've managed to do. And now, what can you do? Well, you can make a Garmin Nuvi or a, an iPod or all of these marvelous things that we saw at the beginning, all of them hinge on this kind of liquid crystal technology. So I hope you've seen now that applications of liquid crystals are everywhere and their popularity and usage is growing daily. I think you've also seen that some basic physics and chemistry underlying these materials helps you understand how and why it is that they're so useful. And hopefully you've also seen that billion dollar industries are really just around the corner from university laboratories. And I thank you very much for your attention.